Well, thank you for the great welcome back here this morning. I sure do appreciate that. And uh, it was definitely a, a, a journey where a lot of lessons have been learned. And between the financial side of things and the inability to adapt to a large city, the large city life, that, that wasn't for me. And the kids had a difficult time with their school and, and trying to get adapted to that. Uh, we were just needed to get back before it was too late, I think. So uh, I just really appreciate the, the warm welcome back and um, any, anything that um, we, can, we can do here would be, would be more than, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, very, I'm just very thankful for the opportunity to come speak here again. Uh, as Joe said during the announcements, I'd like to start, and as, and as I come here to speak, I'd like to stay in this area of Scripture, and it is in Genesis chapter 37, but before you turn there, uh, I would like us to turn to Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 6. So we're going to be in two different places, and our first area of scripture will be in Proverbs. Uh, so if you turn to the middle of your Bible and hit Psalms, go to the right just a little bit and you'll get Proverbs uh, chapter 3 verses 5 through 6. And there is a, that we, I know we probably all have this memorized, this passage of scripture, but there is a, a very important word with, with the where this passage is, and it's the very first word of the passage, uh, Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, and it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. And so we, there, every single word in this passage is important. But let's look at the first, very first word, and it says trust. And our trust has to be in the Lord. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Yahweh. Trust in the Lord. That means God Almighty. And so as we look through the life of Joseph today, and... As we, and as I come back to speak, as we look through the life of, jo uh, of Joseph, I want us to remember that passage. And, and, we will, and we will be going back to that passage. But for now, let's turn to Genesis chapter 37. And we will look at this very, the very beginning of Joseph and who he is and God's plan for Joseph's, not just Joseph's redemption, but for the entire people of Israel. Okay, Joseph's dad's name was Jacob. Jacob's spiritual name was Israel. So God has a plan to restore Israel. And we're going to get into that, but before I go any further, I want us to pray. Father God, as we open your word this morning, we thank you for the worship that's already happened. And as we continue in worship, we ask that you can help us to prepare our hearts and our minds for what we are about to read. And as the, we ask that the Holy Spirit would open our eyes and allow us to understand and to meditate on this passage and its meaning to the the salvation of the Israelites and as well as our salvation in Christ. And we thank you so much for that. And it's in your precious name we pray. Amen. So the, the life of Joseph, Joseph was six years old in, at the beginning when he is moving into the land of Canaan with his father Jacob. Now Jacob... If we go, fur go back further, uh, Jacob and Esau were brothers of Isaac. Okay, so Jacob 
and Esau, as, as they were born from Isaac, uh, Jacob tricked, I don't want to say the word tricked, it was more of a deception. He deceived his father Isaac into making him think that he was Esau, and he received the older brother's blessing. And so that has some implications, or these are the consequences of, part of the consequences of Jacob's deception. So that's just a little bit of a backstory. Now he's traveling through the land of Canaan. Okay, so that's just a little north of Egypt. On a map, uh, Egypt would be southwest, and then Canaan would be up in the northeast, and he has herds of sheep. And, and so he's his brother, or his, sorry, not his brothers, but his sons are taking care of the sheep and the, and the, and the herds. There are probably, there may have been cattle there too, but their jobs were to be shepherds. And so let's read, uh, starting with chapter 37, verse 1, and it says, Now Jacob lived in the land where his father had sojourned in the land of Canaan. These are the records of the generations of Jacob. Joseph, when 17 years of age, was pastoring the flock with his brothers while he was still a youth, along with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. And we're going to stop right there for just a moment. As we read Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 6, I want us, I want us to meditate. Leave that in the back of your mind. And as we, as we consider the word trust, the, the word trust is, is a word that describes faith, that we are believing in Christ, that we are believing in the Word of God, that our trust is in God's Word, okay? So that trust is something that we have to place, that we are responsible for putting in Christ for our salvation, the word trust means that, uh, you know, I keep thinking, I, I was, the, the kids were watching uh, this video on YouTube yesterday, or, or Leighton was, and he, and he said, hey dad, take a look at this. And they had this guy, uh, it was a group of friends, probably four or five friends, and they had this, this that one of their friends had a helmet on, it was blindfolded, and he had a harness strapped to him. And along with this harness, they had him tricked into something, to making him believe that he was going to be bungee jumping. And so they, set, they, they had him out on a dock, and underneath the dock was water. <laughs> so they had him thinking that he was going to be jumping off of a, a ledge, and, be, and he was going to fall, and, and, and the bungee cord was going to bring him back up. Well, in reality, what everybody else saw was this, this guy standing on a ledge at, on a dock, and, and it took him probably a minute to, and that would, that's a lot quicker than I, I would have even been on the ledge. But the, the joke was he was going to jump into the water instead of jumping off of, a, a, of the ledge. And so the, the whole trust exercise, I guess it was, ended when the guy finally jumped off the ledge and landed in the water instead of falling off of, off of the edge. So, he, you know, the entire trust exercise failed when the guy hit the water and he, realized, he finally realized that it was a prank. Okay, so that's the, that's the kind of trust, you know, that the word, that's a picture, that's the picture of the, the word trust. You know, we... I want us to see God in a perspective like we've never seen him before as we are, are going through this, that our greatness, our view of God's greatness, the vastness, the expanse of God is magnified and made exponentially bigger today, and that we would see God in a way that makes us understand who we are 
and who he is, and that our perspective of God would give us peace and understanding in our hearts. So what we're going to see is this is Joseph going through so many trials, and, and we're going to see Joseph uh, struggling in not necessarily struggling in his faith in God, but hitting some very difficult times in his life. And it happens to be due to the consequences of his brothers mistreating him and his father not giving him the correct guidance in the child in, in their childhood and so we're going to we're, we're going to get through this uh, so in verses 2 it says 2 and 3 it says that these are the records of the generations of Jacob Joseph was 17 years of age and was pastoring the flock with his brothers while he was still at a youth along with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. So I have a diagram here, and I got to thinking, so how many brothers did, did Joseph actually have? And from Abraham and Sarah came Isaac. Isaac married Rebekah and had Jacob and Esau. But for Jacob, Jacob had, his, he was married to Leah, and he had Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. And then he was married to Bilhah and had Dan and Naphtali. And then he was married to Zilpah and had Gad and Asher. And then with Leah he had Issachar and Zebulun. And then with Rachel he had Joseph and Benjamin. So Joseph and Benjamin were from Rachel and this is going to have we're, we're going to see how, how all this puts this, this will all fall together in just a couple verses so hang with me Joseph and Benjamin were from the same mom the rest of the brothers and there were maybe a, there was one sister Dinah with from Leah but he had there were 11 other siblings other than the sisters or sis, it says sisters it makes a reference to sisters but the but scripture only mentions the brothers for the patriarchal reasons but for him to have 11 brothers and be the second to youngest is going to have is, is going to show us some relevance here in just a second Let's look at verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons. And there's the problem right there. That's one of the problems. Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons because he was the son of his old age. And he made, for, made him a very colored tunic. Or as we hear... I'm not sure. I'm going to go without this mic for just a second. I don't know if that's the... Yeah, yeah. I'll... You can just... There we go. You can just shut it off, Joe. I think it'll be... Yeah, yeah. I think... Anyway, thank you. Um... Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons because he was the son of his old age. And so when Joseph was born, it was from Rachel. And he loved Rachel and loved Joseph more than the rest of his rest of his sons and daughters and so he favored him by giving him a coat of many colors and what this symbolized was that when Jacob gives his son a coat it symbolized that he was going to be like the firstborn son. It symbolized that he loved him and was giving him the birthrights of the firstborn son. So if you remember, back when he deceived we get Isaac, he was doing that so he would receive 
as the secondborn, he would receive the firstborn's benefits. The, the first, the, so it would be the birthright is the word. No, verse 4, his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, and so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. So there was some major dis, dis, division and dissension upon Joseph from his brothers. So he was like the outcast. All of the brothers were in one group. Joseph was in by himself. And his only closest brother would be Benjamin, Benjamin being the youngest. Verse 5, then Joseph had a dream. So if you could picture this, all right, Joseph being the second to youngest, only Benjamin, and you can imagine since Benjamin was Joseph's full brother and everybody else was Joseph's half-brother, that Benjamin may have, I'm just speculating, Benjamin may have been kind of on the out outward edge, the outside edge of the inner circle of these brothers. And so we have this group of brothers and Joseph being the outcast, Joseph, verse 5, had a dream, and when, it, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. And so I'm thinking to myself, if I was already the outcast, and I had a dream, and, and we'll look into this dream, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go into the group and say, this is my dream. You know, I wouldn't be going to the, the people that are casting me out and say, this is my dream. But here's what Joseph says in verse 6. He said to them, please listen to this dream which I have had. Here we go. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf rose up and also stood erect, and behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheaf. Then his brothers said to him, and how do you think they responded? You think they said, well, in that case, we're going to bow down. No, they're not going to... They're not going to do that. They hated him. The fact that he, and then the fact that he's having a dream about this, saying, hey, not only am I wearing this coat that my dad gave me, not, not our dad, but it's mine because I'm his favorite. Not only am I wearing this coat that you guys don't have because it symbolizes my precedence over you, I have a dream that I am going to be over, over you, and you're going to be bowing down to me. And his brothers said to him in verse 8, Are you actually going to reign over us? Or are you really going to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. So they already hate him because he is being treated like... Better, He's already being treated better than them from their father. And so they hate him for that. They hate him for the coat. And now they hate him even more for his dreams and for his words. So we have three degrees of hate here. He is being hated three degrees. Not only is he an outcast, but they hate him three times now. Verse 9, Now when he still had another dream and related it to his brothers and said, <laughs> I didn't learn, I'm, I'm not, uh, this is not what he said, but I'm saying, I didn't learn the first three times that you hate me. I'm going to come back and you're, I'm going to make you hate me even more. Now he still had another dream and related it to his brothers and said, Lo, I have still had, I have had still another dream and behold the sun and the moon and eleven stars are bowing down to me. He related it to his father and to his brothers and his father father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come to bow ourselves down before you to the ground? 
His brothers were jealous of him, and his fathers kept the saying in mind. And when I read that, I immediately went to Mary pondering all of these things in her heart. When the angel announced to Mary that she would be bearing the uh, Emmanuel, Jesus, the, the one who was to save his people from the, their sins, Mary reflected and pondered these things in her heart. And so I, I think that it would, be, it would be safe to go there with Joseph and Jacob. Because one thing, I, I skipped right past this in my notes. One thing that we need to be looking for here is the parallels of Christ and Joseph. So as we look at this word type, as we see Joseph as a type of Christ, the word type, and I, I was just looking at this, there are 54 synonyms, 54 words that we can use in place of type, according to the Merriam-Webster thesaurus. There are 54 other words, and some of the words that we can use in, in, in exchange for type is symbol or emblem. Uh, from the Latin, we get figure, or image, or form, or kind. And so when we were discussing this in, in Sunday school, I, I was going to save this, but Adam was a type of Christ, just like Joseph is a type of Christ. He is a figure, or image, or what a, a shadow. So in the Old Testament, there are types and shadows of Christ that we can see. And, and it, it is a fuzzy, fuzzy picture picture of Christ at this time. But there are parallels that we can go back and see uh, once we know that what, what Jesus went through, we can go back and see what Joseph went through. And, and, it, and it matches up. There are, it's, it's a parallel. It's running side by side. So uh, I want to read what I wrote down here. Not only do we get to see how God parallels Joseph to Jesus, and that is a great lesson. But we get to see God preserving Israel. So this is a two-fold. We, we get two things out of this study, out of the study of Joseph. We get to see a parallel of Christ, a shadow, and we get to see God preserving Israel. All very important in the history of redemption. Okay, so when we read we, when we read Scripture, it is a revelation of Jesus Christ, and so we this right now. Uh, I remember, and and I I know you will remember, like when when we had tuners on TVs, and you would dial it in just a little bit, and then they get to the fine tuning, and the picture would come in just a little bit better, and so that like if you would move the antennas back and forth a little bit, the picture would get a little fuzzier, and then if you could get uh, get the antenna set just right, it would come in a lot better, and then you could take the dial and dial it in and fine tune that, and you would get a better picture than if the antennas were falling away. So right now, in, in the revelation of Christ, the antennas are set aside. They're, they're kind of off a little bit. And so as we get progress, the progressive revelation, as we get through Scripture, the, the antennas come and the picture gets to be perfect once we get into the New Testament and, and through the, uh, the book of Revelation. But anyway, that was a side note. Let's go back to Joseph. See, it hasn't changed. I still chase rabbits. I still go off. <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't help that. But let's get back to Joseph. Israel's or Jacob's response to this dream was a rebuke. He rebuked Joseph for this dream. But it, it was a soft, mild rebuke because in his heart, you know, he's, he's, saying, he's seeing that, yeah, I can see that your brothers hate you. And so for your protection, I'm, I'm going to rebuke you and say, what is this dream? Do you think... That your mother and your brothers, that, that shall I, verse 10, shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come to bow ourselves down before you to the ground? 
His brothers were jealous of Him, but His Father kept the saying in mind. And, and that, that really parallels to Mary treasuring these things in her heart. And that's not a parallel of the type of Christ. That's just a relation. Verse 12, Then His brothers went to pasture their father's flock in Shechem. Israel said to Joseph, Are you not... Are, are not your brothers pasturing the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send you to them. And he said to him, I will go. Then he said to him, Go now and see about the welfare of your brothers and the welfare of the flock, and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron, which is to the south, it's north, little north of Egypt, northeast of Egypt, probably about 100 to 200 miles, 150 to 200 miles. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. So that's a journey north of about maybe 50 miles. And so he travels up to Shechem, and a man found him. And here we see God's providence. I mean, we see it throughout Scripture, but it is... It is dialed in right here. We are going to see God's providence working right here. And, and, and God is going to be placing Joseph in a very difficult situation, in a very difficult environment, almost beyond the ability to survive. But through this, Joseph makes it and and it comes about that Joseph is going to be overseeing Egypt and rescuing the people his family from a great famine and I fast forwarded to the end of the story because I want us to 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 see how God it, this this is just the beginning of Joseph's life of going down into the depths, into the pit. But to know that the light, I don't want to say the light is at the end of the tunnel, but that there is hope. There is Rescue. There is restoration. There is redemption. And God is going to deliver Joseph from what is about to happen. <coughs> Excuse me. God is placing, actually, He is placing Joseph in this pit. And God is going to deliver him from this pit into redemption. And this is where it starts. Verse 15, A man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, What are you looking for? He said, I am looking for my brothers. Please tell me where they are pasturing the flock. Then the man said, They have moved from here, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. After Joseph's dreams, his brothers go up and they're at work in, in uh, what his father, what Jacob thought would be Shechem, but they actually went just a little bit further north, maybe a few miles, to Dothan. All right? And so they're, they're not where they're supposed to be. Who knows why they're in Dothan? But other than the fact that this, as Joseph is wandering around Shechem, they're not in Shechem, and God provides a man to tell Joseph where his brothers are. So he takes them from wandering around and, and sends them to Dothan, sends him to Dothan, and when, verse 18, when they saw him from a distance, this is where Joseph's life is going to be changed dramatically. When they saw him from a distance, 
And before he came close to them, they plotted against him to put him to death. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Now then come and let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. And we will say, A wild beast devoured him. Then let us see what will become of his dreams. But Reuben heard this and rescued him out of their hands and said, Let us not take his life. Reuben further said to them, Shed no blood, throw him into this pit that is in the wilderness, but do not lay hands on him, that he might rescue him out of their hands to restore him to his father. So he was secretly trying to get to rescue Joseph from their from them trying to kill him. Let's let me go back to that chart and see who was Reuben was from Leah. He was he would have been Jacob's firstborn son. So this is why Reuben is saying, let's rescue him. Let let's not kill him because Reuben being the oldest son would be the one ultimately responsible for all of the brothers and responsible for Joseph. Reuben being the firstborn was probably placed in charge and so if Reuben, if, if they were to kill Joseph or if they're to go back without Joseph, Reuben is going to be held responsible. So it came about in verse 23 when Joseph reached his brothers, that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the very colored tunic that was on him, and they took him and threw him into the pit. Now the pit was empty, without any water in it. Then they sat down to eat a meal. So that, and that kind of threw me off a little bit. They just threw their, young, uh, their second to youngest, one of their, you know, one of their brothers into a pit and what's the next thing they do they sit down and to eat a meal and as they raised their eyes and looked behold a caravan of Ishmaelites was coming from Gilead with their camels bearing aromatic gum and balm and myrrh on their way to bring them down to Egypt Judah said to his brothers so now Judah is is going to be coming up with an idea. And Judah is the fourth brother, the youngest of with Leah. So Reuben and Judah are full brothers, so there's a pack of four of them. And Reuben's the oldest with Leah, and Judah is the, the youngest with Leah. And so Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it for us to kill our brother and cover up his blood. Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Then came Midianite traders, and Midianite and Ishmaelites would be uh, the same kind of people. They're both inner... Uh, intermarried and and it's a whole uh, different clan of people from Esau uh, Ishmael um, so or I'm sorry Ishmael and so they would be uh, you could enter you, you could use that word Ishmaelites and Midianites and then some Midianite traders passed by, so they pulled him up and lifted Joseph out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. Thus they brought Joseph into Egypt. So they sell their brother as a slave. There is a parallel to Christ. When Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver, he, that was the price of a slave. They sell Joseph for 20 shekels of silver, which is the price of a slave here. There's our parallel, one of our parallels. Now Reuben returned to the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit. So... 
Reuben is going to start freaking out. And Joseph was not in the pit, so he tore his garments, meaning he, he was upset. So he gets so frustrated that he rips his garments. He returned, and it shows uh, remorse, and it shows uh, shame. He returned to his brothers and said, The boy is not there. As for me, where am I to go? So they took Joseph's tunic and slaughtered a male goat and dipped the tunic in, in the blood. And they sent the very colored tunic and brought it to their father and said, We found this. Please examine it to see whether it is your son's tunic or not. Then he examined it and said, It is my son's tunic. So let's go back real quick to, to Esau, what he did with Jacob. Or sorry. He is Jacob. What he did with Isaac, uh, and he, he deceived Isaac in making him think that he was Esau. He put on Esau's clothes, or, or, or clothes that, that was, uh, made him feel like he was hairy. Uh, he put on the, some, some uh, beast's fur to make him smell like the field so that when Jake, or sorry, I did it again. When Isaac smelled Jacob, he thought that he would be smelling Esau. When he touched Jacob, he thought that his skin felt like Esau's skin. And so he gave him the blessing. And what happens here? This then he examined it and said, As my son's tunic, a wild beast has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. So Jacob tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. Then all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, Surely I will go down to Sheol. This is the very first time that Sheol's mentioned in the Old Testament. In mourning for my son, it means the grave, the place where, to, where death it is a reference to death. So I will go down to my grave in mourning for my son. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold him in Egypt. So he's being sold to Potiphar, sold him into Egypt to Potiphar, Pharaoh's officer, the captain of the bodyguard. And we're going to stop there. We did it. We made it through chapter 37. It's, it's a little uh, later in the time, but uh, I want us to come back to this spot when I'm back. And I want us to remember Potiphar, the, I'm going to borrow from MacArthur here, Potiphar was a prominent court official and high-ranking officer in Egypt, perhaps captain of the royal bodyguard. His name, a most unusual grammatical form for that period, it either meant the one whom the god Ra has given or the one who was placed on earth by Ra. Ra is the sun god. So Potiphar is a ruler in Egypt and he worships the sun god. He is, or he is brought about from the worshipers of a sun god. And that's idolatry. But right now, Joseph is without his coat, without his family. He has been sold into slavery, into Egypt. He, well, he's been cast down into the pit and his brothers, instead of killing him, pull, pulled him out of the pit and sold him into slavery. And so right now, Joseph's life is in shambles. But we, what we are going to see is that, the, that Joseph's faith and his trust in the Lord is going to bring him through this. He trusts that God is going to deliver him from this. And it's going to be a very difficult road for Joseph. But it was a very difficult road for Christ. And we're going to move into communion now. And I want us to turn to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Verses 9 and 10. As, as we are going to be looking at Joseph's life, the Lord willing, 
we are going to see a very difficult time in, in, a, in a human being's life. And when Christ left His place in heaven, He did so under the, the supervision, under the, not supervision, but under the command of the Father. And He did so knowing that there was going to be a difficult life ahead. That it, none of it, there is no part in the life of Christ that was ever easy. And verse 9 in Hebrews chapter 2 says, But we do see Him, Jesus, who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God, He might taste death for everyone. By the grace of God, Jesus might taste death for everyone. Verse 10, For it was fitting for Him, Jesus, for whom are all things, and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. What, G what happened to Jesus on the cross and through His life, mainly on the cross, but throughout His entire life, He is being subject to this world. This world was once under his feet as, his, as he was the creator. As God created everything through him, this world was his creation. Yet, he humbled himself, came to this earth, and tasted death for everyone. Not only when, and when, when we say that he tasted death, I'm going to elaborate on that in just a moment. Um, Joe and Danny, could you come forward this morning? When we say Jesus tastes taste of death, it means that this bread that is broken represents His broken body. And in order for Jesus to taste death for everyone, the, the sins of the world had to have been placed on Him and not only the sin, but the wrath of God. The, the eternal conscious torment of sinning against the Holy God. And so this bread represents the broken body of Jesus Christ on the cross for our salvation. And so as we take this bread, as we eat this bread, it is symbolic of the broken body of Jesus Christ. And as He established and instituted this in the upper room on the night that He was betrayed, He said that this bread is His body. It represents His body. So I'll pray for us and we will distribute the bread. Father God, as we take this bread, Help us to remember. Help us to reflect on the life of Christ, on the life of Your Son, broken on the cross. Not one bone was broken, but His body was 
nailed to the cross. Everything that Christ came to do on this earth was being fulfilled through His death and His life. His life and His death and His resurrection. And as we take this bread, help us to remember that. In Your name we pray.
lot of strength. Scripture says that at First Corinthians chapter eleven, that as often as we eat of the bread and drink of the cup, we do so proclaiming the Lord until He returns. Until He comes back, and that's what we're we remember His life, death, and resurrection, and His return, and our meeting Him. I'll close this in prayer and be dismissed. Father God, as we look at our lives, we thank You for providing us with everything that we have. We know that in the midst of our trials and tribulations, our sorrows and our griefs, that You are there. You never leave us. You never forsake us. You never turn Your back from us. But You're right there beside us. And though sometimes in our own minds and in our own hearts, you may seem so far away. You're not. Help us to combat that lie, that deception, that you aren't, the, the lie that you are away from us, that, and help us to trust in your word that tells us you are here with us, in our hearts, in our lives. You can't get any closer. But in our minds and in our hearts, we create distance. Help us to combat that with Your Word by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah, I think.